All right, guys, we're going to do a, a little quicker job today, only 20, 25 minutes. Um, and what we're going to look at today is a new unit on imperialism. Right? And imperialism is very simply when one country is able to exert their power, their strength, and their influence over a weaker country. They can do this through either diplomatic means, or if that doesn't work, you can go militarily or through economic power. The strong country is going to use its influence to take over and exploit the weaker one. So think of the Spanish going into Mexico with Hernando Cortez. Combined with the ideas of nationalism, it is imperialism that is going to fuel the Western world and be a major driving force behind World War I. And so domination of one country over the economic and cultural life of another. First wave was going to be the Americas, north and south. Again, that's the Spanish, you know, the French, the English, and the Americas. Then it's going to go to the coast of Africa, how we talked about, and then it's going to happen in China. The second wave of new or neo-imperialism is going to get the interior of Africa, China, and India, and South Asia is going to be added to the mix, as well as Southeast Asia. So imperialism around the world, as you're going to see how all of this takes place, these different colors, like yellow is Portugal, the light Carolina blue is France. Um, try and find a, another easier one for us to um, pick out. The greenish color here is going to be Great Britain. And you can see Great Britain is going to be everywhere around the globe. Germany, France, and Japan, and the Netherlands are going to jump into the game. It happens all over the place. So take a look at that map, and you're going to see... Areas heavily exploited are going to be Asia, South Asia, and Africa are just going to be pillaged during um, imperialism. And why does this all start? Well, it's going to be economic interests. Right? The Industrial Revolution and nationalism kick off this craze for expanding territory. All right? It is the end thing to do. Like a couple weeks ago, everyone was going to buy, you know, toilet paper. Like they were never going to make them anymore. And this idea kind of gets rooted and captures the minds of the Europeans well into the late 1800s, early 1900s. And it was their unquenchable thirst. This, this quest to capture territory destroys the peace and prosperity that Europe wanted um, after the Napoleonic Wars, after you know, Clemens von Metternich's Concert of Europe, it's going to destroy all of that. It is also going to lead to the building and destroying of various European alliances. And one of the motives that, that, that we have to talk about is you see you know, England and France carving up the globe like it is a Thanksgiving turkey, um, is going to be social Darwinism. And the idea behind social Darwinism is that Europeans felt that their way of life was better and superior to all those around the world. Think of the old Disney classic Pocahontas, again, where John Smith says, oh, we're going to help you people build roads and cities and bridges and, and towns. And Pocahontas says, well, what's wrong with the way, we're, the way we're doing it? Who needs who to survive here, John Smith? Do I need you or do you need me? Our way of life is better. And so Europeans felt that it was their mission and responsibility to help what they saw as backwards people, inferior territories, people who need our help. Along with this was the religious conviction and co competition, excuse me, to convert natives to Christianity. And perhaps the biggest of all motivations for European imperialism is all about the economics. All right. Western society's powerful industrial businesses needed raw materials. Maybe it's rubber. Maybe it's cork. Maybe it's iron ore and bauxite gold. Whatever it is, 
Western powerful businesses needed raw materials or extra space to help them grow. And the best place to do this is in these so-called inferior territories where there was no industry. We can get people raw materials for cheap and we can get people to work for relatively nothing at all. Or maybe we can get them to do it for free. And then the third advantage is going to be military. Here is the um, social Darwinism here. Um, you know, because of our science and technology, we are better than you is the thought. So um, other things that, that aid this is military is going to be twofold. Europeans are always ultra competitive. All right, you see the guys carving up the turkey here. And if France gets one country, then England's got to get two. If England gets two, then Germany's got to get three. If Germany gets three, then France has got to get four. All right? It was this, like, you know, the European Soccer League, if, you know, people, you always want to have more countries than your neighbor. The belief in imperialism is that Europeans simply continue to increase the number of imperial colonies. European countries also wanted to have borders or colonies on the borders of their opponents strategic to keep an eye on them. This is the way they maintain their balance of power. And European countries, because of technology, could colonize anywhere. It didn't even matter if it's useful. France will capture part of the Sahara Desert they're like, oh, yes, oh, look what these, we have these. And everyone else is like, hmm, oh, boy, there's nothing there but, like, sand, all right? France gobbled it up simply because they could. That way their competitor couldn't have it. And so it's the Western advantages, as we were talking about, as it comes to the military. Industrialization allowed the ability to mass-produce items, all right? Strong militaries, all right, the machine gun, the steam engine, all right, will give Europe the ability to pose their will on people and to extract resources. The Europeans open up Africa as if they never could before. Before, the sailboat, they couldn't get up the big rivers. And if they did, they came to a waterfall and they're like, shoot, we can't go any farther. Well, now... The steam-powered steamship can chug up to the waterfall. They can offload cargo and build a railroad through the woods or the jungle around that waterfall, bring another boat, a smaller boat, on the train around the track and dump it back in the river and keep going, or carve a railroad straight through the jungle. In this way, they can directly get the industrial raw materials, put them on a train, Chug, chug, woo, woo, take it right back to the boat, put them on the boat, down the river, up the Atlantic Ocean, or right to the factories in Europe. It allows further um, exploitation of the interior of Africa, the resources, and the people. The continent and the people are just going to be ravaged. And it also is the, the mindset that while imperialization was about making money, we're doing a good thing. As we come in and, and tear up your land for resources, you should be saying thank you because we are helping you. And this is all started by this nefarious character, King Leopold of Belgium. Um, the industrialized world, again, you can't see it from, from my house or my garage, uh, that we don't care what's happening to the native populations. Um, we can't see it, so what happens, the natives doesn't impact me at home. All I know is I'm making money, I'm getting rich, so it doesn't really matter. It's the Europeans that will start imperialism, but eventually everyone, even the United States, is going to get involved um, as well. It's going to start here with King Leopold of Belgium. And I want you to look at this. Purple is France. This pink is um, Great Britain, this lighter purple is Portugal, this kind of pea green is Germany, brown is Belgium, orange is Spain, the bluish here is kind of Italy. Only two countries remain independent. One is Liberia, purchased by the United States to, to return freed slaves. 
um, um, after the Civil War, and the other one is Ethiopia, and Italy tries hard to take out Ethiopia. The entire continent will be colonized during this period. Think of, you know, when here Imperial, you know, it's not only Julius Caesar, but it's bum, bum, ba -dum, you know, it's the Imperial March of Darth Vader coming in. And so going back into the four, late 1400s, Europeans, you know, the Portuguese were moving around the coastlines of Africa here. By the 1800s, Europeans are beginning to explore the interior of Africa. Remember the story that I told you about Richard Burton finding the source of the Nile River um, way on? Well, the Europeans are following rivers to, to, to find the sources of them. They're finding things like Mount Kilimanjaro and Lake Victoria. And since Africa as a continent is many times larger than, than that of Europe, the people here have different languages and religions and diversity. Think of the Africa unit we did, um, you know, um, back in January. All right, um, people are very diverse. They, you know, these cultures have existed in Africa for thousands of years, and now the European governments call it the Dark Continent because they didn't know anything about it. Nothing to do with differences in skin pigmentation. They were going out there to learn and find out what was going on. So in 1870, King Leopold is going to kick off what is known as the Great Scramble. And if you would go to the Congo today, you see all these big, you know, like European victory gates, all to glorify King Leopold. Here he is drawn as like a dad, you know, with Africans being little children as he's cradling them. There is, you know, the monument to King Leopold in the Congo, like he does all of this, you know, great stuff. And outside of it, you have the fountains of, of you know, different African tribes and, and wild animals. They're all surrounding the great King Leopold, who did nothing but bring hardship and nastiness. Um, cat of, of Glog by a lady named Alice Harris who went in and found out what the Belgians were doing when people would refuse to work, cutting off the feet and the hands of even small children to be able to extract resources. Just some, just some terrible things. It was all, all about rubber. Here are some of the pictures that Miss Harris was able to take, and you get the great Joseph Conrad book, The Heart of Darkness. It's a good book. I don't know if you read it in school or not, but it is a, it is a, a worthy read. So, anyhow, um, 1870, King Leopold is going to kick off the Great Scramble. All right. And he hires American explorer Henry Staley to go in and explore the Congo River. And this is the famous um, story where it was, uh, where's my map here? Um, Dr. Livingstone, I presume, where Dr. Livingstone, this famous British scientist went in to study language and culture, and he doesn't make it back for the boat to pick him up, and they wait a couple more months, and they send another boat, and he's not there. And finally, Henry Staley is sent in to find him, and he follows the Congo River, and he gets down here to a place called Victoria Falls by Zimbabwe, and he's standing there looking at this beautiful waterfall, and here comes a Caucasian dude with a backpack, you know, and like a loincloth walking out of the woods, and he's like, oh, hey. Got the Livingstone, um, I presume. He went to the continent of Africa and found his guy in just a um, couple weeks. But it is this guy, um, Henry Staley, that sent out to chart the Congo River and, if possible, arrange trade agreements with different kings or chieftains, just like the Portuguese did way back when. Now, back home in Belgium, good old King Leopold tells his people that, you know, look, I, this is a Christian mission. I'm coming down here to help civilize these poor people. They need us. We're like a parent to a small child. That's what he tells his public. In reality, um, he does this to garner their support. He wanted the territory. He wanted the resources. He wanted industrial resources. He wanted to rival the big main players in Europe. And once King Leopold II gets started, the great scramble is on as England and France and Germany are tripping and fighting and knocking each other out trying to get territory in and around the Congo River. 
So this brings up what is known as the Berlin Conference. You can see there's dudes around here. They're standing around a, a table. And literally, the Berlin Conference was uh, a way to try and avoid the warfare um, that might come as a result of territorial conflict. So in 1884, 14 European countries meet at an international conference hosted in Berlin. Not one single African king or tribal chieftain was invited. The European powers literally sat around the table. You can see, you know, Portugal, Germany, you know, Italy, Spain, France, Belgium, all sitting there. Just on the Dutch are down here, like they're playing Risk. I'll take this one, or like they're playing Settlers of Catan. You get one, you get one, you get two, okay. Um, you, you three have gotten one, I'm going last, so I'll pick two. They went around and just carved up the entire continent. All right. Now this conference does this, um, and they will recognize that Belgium had, you know, claim to the land in the Congo. So you got the land, Belgium, but everybody here can use the river, open access for trade along the major rivers. And the conference also stated that to control a territory, you had to have some sort of governmental presence there. You couldn't just say, well, I want South Africa. No, your government, you've got to have a flag there, an outpost, trading post, military outpost, whatever it was. And here's where England is going to have a large leg up because of the British East India Company, the joint stock company where people would invest in the company to outfit and pay you know, um, for ships and sailors and exploration to go get trade goods. Well, the British have depots all over. If you remember the green that I showed you, they have East India Company outposts all over the world. So instantly, they've got access right there. So Europeans do this in an all-out sprint to capture Africa. Now, when I talk about governmental presence, um, you know, again, England has the big advantage here because the British Crown said every worker for the East India Company is now part of the British government. So the British are out in front. Now the impact on Africa is going to be something large. Europeans begin to exert their power over the local tribes and over the local village in this all-out race to capture African territory. The Europeans did this with little understanding of African geography or the traditional way that Africans existed. Sometimes, you know, you use this as winter grazing lands for your herds. And maybe in the summer we plant our crops there. It's migration patterns for people and for animals. The land was shared. It was used. But Europeans like geographical boundaries, you know, a river, a lake, a mountain chain, something physical. So my territory starts here, and this is where yours ends. And they begin to disrupt human and animal migration patterns around Africa, all right, who maybe moved their herds and rotated them. You know, um, the, the people had, had worked this out for years, and it's the Europeans that cut off the land from animals and people who had used them for centuries. And so as I said, by the time they were done, it was only Liberia and Ethiopia that remained um, independent. Now, in Europe, there was a growing interest in Africa. It was the new place to go. Let's go on vacation to Timbuktu or to Egypt. Um, the people were into it, as were businesses. And in Europe, people saw Africa as an outlet to gain their necessary natural resources or as a market for their finished products. We can grab natural resources or we can have an outlet for finished products. So as I said, England will gobble up the most territory 
as they use what's called the indirect system of administration. I'll have a slide here about this um, eventually. And indirect is simply those outposts of the British East India Company, the port facilities, the dock facilities, the warehouses, whatever it is, they count. So they simply name someone there to be an English governor and you act on behalf of for English business. The French are going to use a different system known as direct control. They will literally go and build physical governmental outposts and they will send a supply of soldiers like the famous French legionnaires with their big hat with a flap in the back and the, and the um, brim on it. The most famous French legionnaire go out into the desert. So the French build physical things there and send down a member of the French government where the British just use the East India Company. And so as we've talked, you know, time and time and time again about, you know, world history is full of violence and, and exploitation, the imperialist takeover of Africa is one of the darkest and most violent parts in all of world history. Coupled with the Spanish conquest of the Aztecs, and the Incas. This is one of the greatest outright exploitations of people and resources in all of world history. The one positive that comes out of it is that a small segment of the African population will go to Western schools to be educated, like Oxford and Cambridge and the University de Paris. And these new, you know, African intellectuals come back. And they start intellectual movements that are going to pop up. Um, some of them want, are accepting uh, of the West and saying we can learn. Others are resistant. So a small group of the people wanted to copy some of what was going on in the Western world to advance forward. On the other hand, many more didn't like what the West was doing and said, no, 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 no. We've been here for thousands of years. Why change anything? But this will eventually lead to African nationalist movements. And the world is seeing the repercussions of it to this day. Different groups wanting their own nation in Africa. However, during the imperialistic conquest of Africa, the educated African population will work to use any means necessary to broker trade agreements to create diplomatic envoys and even declare war on what's going on. They wanted to either take advantage of each other or find a way to unite and work against the Europeans. And so when World War II is over and the movement of decolonization, it's the Western educated Africans try to use what they learn to gain independence for themselves and their people. Take a brief run down here to uh, you know, South Africa, you know, with you know, um, Rhodesia, old Zimbabwe, um, uh, Zaire, and the Cape Colony. Down here, there were a highly trained group of people by the great war leader Shaka Zulu. And they were kind of like the Spartans of South Africa. And they've got a centralized territory down here in Southern Africa. And there will be great battles where some of the underdog Zulus are going to win. But in the end, it's British technology is going to defeat the Zulus and pit the British up against people called Boers or, you know, um, you know Dutch farmers or Afrikaners who had been there since the Cape Colony. This will begin a large clash between Great Britain and the Netherlands in which even Winston Churchill took part and was held prisoner for um, a long time. And it was the first example of a modern total war where industry and people were all mobilized for success. And anybody caught in the crossfire was fair game. There was little differentiation between a civilian and a combatant, which is normally a um, soldier. The Boers are going to use guerrilla hit and run tactics so in response, the British will use scorched earth. That means they burn crops. They um, destroy water wells. They kill herds. 
They even imprison women. And what's horrible is that they send you know, people to these concentration camps, which you don't hear about, and even little kids wind up um, starving. And the British, just like they used the Native Americans in the French and Indian War, will enlist black South Africans to be a guard or to be a scout or to even help out in the fighting. And so by the early 1900s, England um, adds one more um, part to its worldwide empire as they defeat the Boer republics and they become the Union of South Africa governed by the British. Um, and this will begin the apartheid movement that we will talk about um, later on. So anyway, um, when it's all said and done, here is European imperialism again up until 1914. The two big victors in Africa are going to be France, which you can see in this bluish, kind of like this Duke blue. That's for Ryan and, and Nick there. And the most prominent European language spoken in Africa is um, French. And then this um, you know, purplish pink here is going to be the English colonies. And after that, you've got Germany and um, Belgium here in the middle. But it's only Ethiopia and Liberia. So the two big winners are England and France. Again, here is the, uh, the methods of management. Indirect control, where we are going to rely on existing leaders and members of the British East India Company are going to handle the management of the British Empire at first. All right, We're going to train local leaders in the British method of government and use our East India Company workers. It is the French who are going to say, no, no, these guys don't know enough. They can handle it by themselves. So we are going to show them how to do it our way. We will send down a governor. We will rule the people. They have no native rights or um, privileges. And we are going to try and assimilate them and turn them into us, whether we're French, whether we're German, whether they're Portuguese or Spanish. And the French will set up schools, businesses, legal systems along um, French lines. So that's it for um, African imperialism. We've got a lot more to do. We're going to try and make these shorter on you guys so you guys will actually watch them.